I've said it multiple times throughout this sermon series, so I'll start off this week's message by saying it again. The value of holistic generosity in our lives as disciples of Jesus is not about the dollar amount. If that's what you're focused on when it comes to your generosity, then you are focused in the wrong place. Not that the dollar amount isn't an important point of discussion. It certainly is. But, and we will get there in this sermon series, but we're not there yet. We still need to dive a little bit deeper into God's view and perspective of our generosity and how we live that out then as his disciples. So go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to dive right in to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 12. You can use your Bibles, the Bible there in front of you. If you brought, your, if it's on your phone, your tablet, you're welcome to use that as well. But Mark chapter 12. And we're going to hear that, that gospel reading that we heard just minutes ago. Mark chapter 12, second gospel New Testament, verse 41. Mark records, and he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury. And he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums of money, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Using this passage, almost all scholars would agree that Jesus is teaching to the disciples the truth that generosity is a heart issue. It's not a dollar issue, it is a heart issue. But there's so much more to this text than simply recognizing the amazing heart of the widow as she literally gave all that she had left and an offering to God. What is the heart of this widow that Jesus is actually celebrating and highlighting for his disciples so that they learn about his command in their lives? Well, to better understand that, we've got to go a little bit back in this chapter of Mark. At this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus is being questioned heavily by the religious leaders who are blatantly trying to trap him and blasphemous teaching so that they can get rid of him and have reason to do so. And we won't dive into all of the questions, but go back up to verse 28. Mark 12, verse 28. One of the scribes came up, and they, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? See, the the immediate scene before this widow giving everything that she had in this life was a question of Jesus regarding which commandment his disciples had to obey. What was the one thing they had to make sure that they were doing? Let's keep reading. Verse 29. Jesus answered, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And... (laughs) Conjunctions matter. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and To love one's neighbor as yourself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Just pause here for a second. I always kind of chuckle at this. Can you imagine being the scribe telling to the Son of God, hey, you answered that question correctly? Good job, man. Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Many of us know that answer more or less by heart, right? Love God above all things. Love our neighbors as ourselves. But this is exactly the struggle that we live out 
as we wrestle with generosity in our lives. This is exactly where we struggle when it comes to living out that generosity that Christ has set us free to live out in our daily lives. What is contrasted here at the end of this scene in the Gospel of Mark is the widow doing exactly this. She is loving God above all things, including the two small copper coins that she has in her pocket, including the innate desire that is within each of us to survive and to do everything within our power and our will to survive, to cling to what we can control. In this case, her two small copper coins to to cling what we control with tooth and nail and never surrendering, never giving up. She throws it in the offering box. What is contrasted here at the end of this scene in Mark's gospel is the widow doing exactly this. She is loving her neighbor above herself. As she gives what she literally has remaining of her money to the offering box which was used to provide for the poor and the needy in the community. It was used for the needs of the temple, the the needs of the religious leaders, the needs of the poor in the community, which ironically would have included her in this case. But to do it because she believed and trusted in a need greater than herself. She loved her neighbor above herself. And I think a point that often gets overlooked is what Jesus says in verse 44. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. You see, when we give with a heart that loves God above all things, and a heart that is seeking to love our neighbor above our own, we, like the widow, actually give out of priority for God's work in our lives. Not out of the remainder of the abundant blessings that he's given to us. Which begs the question, do I give out of priority Or do I give out of abundance? Neither Jesus nor Mark in his account of the scene says whether the widow survived after she gave of her two last coins. Or if somehow she came across a large sum of money that allowed her to live a more luxurious life than ever imagined possible Or that God blessed her faithfulness by returning to her 1,000-fold the two copper coins that she puts in in the offering box. Essentially, Mark does not say, and Jesus does not say either, what is so often said in that gospel, that prosperity gospel minded preaching and teaching. The hard part in this text is that the widow may have received nothing in return for her gift. See, that's not actually the point of generosity, is it? To get something back when we give. Like I said last week, our lives as of holistic generosity are a faithful effort to steward well that which God has given to us and with His intention. And that which God has given to us is the very love of God and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the the freedom that has been won for us from sin, death, and the devil in his death and resurrection, and the incredible grace and mercy shown to us every day of our lives that we now have the opportunity to share with the world around us. The issue of the heart here, especially in our Western cultural mindset, is that we often think of this love of God in an intimate, personal, one-to-one relationship. And it is true. God loves you personally, individually, and intimately. But His heart is not only for you. And His heart is not only for me. God's heart is actually for 
all people. Everyone. Which then begs the question, is my heart for all people? Is your heart for all people? See, that's the pivotal question to ask in prayerful confession. As we look at our our lives of holistic generosity. Because what we give in in generosity is actually our stewarding of what God has given to us. Remember week one, Psalm 24, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and, and those who dwell in it. And then remember last week that, that God's generosity is not limited in our lives. He will never stop lavishing us in his grace and mercy. He will never stop providing for us or walking with us in this life or, or giving to us out of his outstanding, abundant, never ending love and mercy. Consider what he says through the prophet Malachi as he called the people to repentance. He said, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to, to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you blessing until there is no more need. God's heart is for all people. Not just you. It's not just me. It's not just our kids and our grandkids. It's not just for those who call this community their church home at peace. God's heart is for all people. And as his disciples set free from sin and guilt and shame and the very death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as those redeemed to be his people of hope and blessing to the world around us. Our heart is to be for all people, too. So at peace, our heart is for all people. This is how I, as your pastor, seek to faithfully use your gifts and offerings to the ministry of peace. Yes, they they are used to ensure the lights are turned on, that we have cool air cooling our spaces in the hot summer months, and warm air heating those spaces in the cooler winter months. They're used to ensure that we have staff to lead our discipleship efforts and repairs on our building from the youngest being 22 years old to the oldest being 60 plus years old. Your gifts and offerings are used to provide resources for our our ministry programming to be able to dream up and implement new ministry opportunities. But all of it, every single minute of effort that is poured into our ministry at peace should be And I try very hard to ensure that it is done with a heart for all people. Go back to Mark 12. Go up to verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself is the, and the Holy Spirit declare, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And a great throng heard him gladly. Verse 38, and in his teaching he said, beware the scribes, interestingly enough, who just asked him a question, beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and like greetings in the marketplaces, and have the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive their greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came, and she put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, 
This widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. My challenge to you this week is to reflect on this question. Is my generosity from a heart for all people? It's very easy for us to make our life of faith, our trust in God, a very personal, intimate endeavor. But maybe this week, maybe this week, invite a friend to coffee and have them answer that question for you. Sharing with you how they have seen you or or maybe they haven't seen you have a heart for all people. Confess your struggle when it's not. Between you, me, and the fence posts, I have to regularly have a prayer of confession with God. (laughs) Because even as your pastor, I struggle with a heart that is not always for all people. But that's the beauty of reflecting on this question as disciples of Jesus. Because he doesn't turn us away. He doesn't shame us. He doesn't lower the boom on us and smatter us to dust. He loves us. And he forgives us. And he sets us free so that once again we can seek to love him above all things and and to love those that he places around us. And he does it every single day. And as we do this, as we go to him in prayer and in confession and in repentance, his spirit does this beautiful thing within us. And the light of our Savior shows just a little bit more through us into the world of darkness around us. And others, the very people that we are called to love above ourselves, are shown the hope of life and of salvation and freedom in our Savior Jesus Christ. To God alone be the glory, now and always. Amen.